Welcome to Scrapple TV. Hi, I'm Robert Platchorn, also known as the Black Tuna. I'm the man who spent more time in prison for a nonviolent marijuana offense than anyone in America. I spent 30 years in 11 different federal prisons. South Florida is now called the dope smuggling capital of the country. In the mid-70s, there was a move to legalize marijuana. 13 million Americans use marijuana regularly. At a House hearing today, the Carter administration favored easing the penalties they face for that use. We thought it was going to be legalized, and if we were going to make money, now was the time to do it. I was born and raised at 7th and South. My mom had a children's store there called the Sissy Shop, uh, after my sister and my dad was manager of Goldman Shoe Store down at 2nd and South. We lived above our store at 7th and South and all my friends lived above their stores. Back when South Street had clothing stores and furniture stores and bridal shops, uh, practically anything you could ever want was on South Street. And it was the only street in Philadelphia that was open on Sunday. I was out on the fairs selling Vitamixes. I was a pitchman. And someone came up to me, someone in the pitch business, and said to me, Bobby, I've been driving loads from Florida in the wintertime when there's no work in the pitch business. And if I can sell some, I can make a lot more money instead of just being a driver. He said, do you know anybody who can take 1,500 pounds? I said, yeah, I think I do. And I called my partner, Robbie. I said, Robbie, you know anybody who can take 1500 And he said, I have a couple of friends who, who are selling pot. They could probably do that. I was in the pot business. Holy Jesus! I just brought down one bush, man. That's just the top. Birds, man! Yeah, I don't know how much to bring down. They smell, smell good, don't they? Oh. You think we can sell some of that shit? Oh, man, you know how much this stuff's worth? Oh, I don't know. I've been out of circulation a little bit. I thought maybe 100 bucks. <laughs> 2,500 bucks a pound, man. Are you shitting me? We worked as a middle for most of a year. Living down there, people would come to me and, can you sell my load? I'd call Robbie and the loads would go up to Philadelphia and get sold. Eventually, we had more customers than we had access to marijuana. And the next step was to become a smuggler. Each of us wanted to make $1 million and we were done. And that's exactly what happened. It took three or four trips because not everything goes right. The first trip, uh, we were supposed to bring in 800 pounds, but only 400 arrived. And then the next load, we borrowed money from our customers and we did 5,000 pounds and we made some money. Well, DC-3 held 5,000 pounds, and in theory, the profit was $1 million from the entire load. The pilot would get 150,000, the co-pilot would get 50,000. Uh, you needed four or five or six guys to unload the airplane, they'd get 10 or 20,000 bucks each. If you were in an airplane with 5,000 pounds a pot, just the molecules coming up from the heat of the skin of the airplane. When you walked into the plane, especially down on the field when it was just loaded, the miasma, you could see it. And you would just get wrecked. And then we did a couple of boats and finally ended up after everybody was paid with a million bucks each, retired, and a year and a half later got indicted. I never saw the name Black Tuna till I was indicted. We never knew we were the Black Tuna gang. Uh, you know, the government has to put a label on everything if they're going to get a lot of publicity out of it. And somewhere they had come across a picture of me, similar to the one in the book, with the tuna, and they dubbed us the Black Tuna gang. The first place I actually saw it large and live was after we were indicted, we went to DEA headquarters and to see the evidence. And 
on the door of the evidence room, it said Black Tuna War Room. We didn't get caught, not with anything. Uh, over a year after we quit, we were indicted on a conspiracy indictment, i.e. someone, the first guy who sold me merchandise at the Milwaukee State Fair. He had gotten caught and he said, pointed a finger and he said, I sold him 1,500 pounds and 1,400 pounds and 1,200 pounds. And it was all hearsay because the shit was gone. The DEA had really nothing much going for them. The FBI needed a new business. They couldn't go after make-believe communists anymore. They wanted to get into the dope business. The DEA wanted to stay in business and be merged with the FBI. We were the test case. The FBI made the decision there was going to be a war on drugs, and Miami was the battle line where the drug war was going to be fought. They had never done that before. It was called Operation Banco. They spent six million bucks to trace the flow of cash from the Federal Reserve in Miami to Columbia. The Federal Reserve in Miami had more money than any other Federal Reserve Bank, in fact, more than all of them. They found the banker who was moving most of the money, a man by the name of Juan Poe, who was vice president of uh, Royal Trust of Scotland. And we were bringing money to him in suitcases, and so were a whole lot of other people. But it turns out Juan Poe was part of the old Cuban brigade. And that translates into CIA, because all the Cuban anti-Castro brigades were, were part of a CIA movement. So just like all the smugglers who got caught who were Cubans and, and part of that, all Juan Po got was that, a year suspended sentence. Here's the guy they're looking for. Now they have no case. And this is the end of their budget. And that's why the Black Tuna case was so blown out of proportion, because two agencies were desperate. My prison sentence was 64 years, and most of it was under the Kingpin statute. And even though there was parole in those days, the Kingpin statute was a non-parolable offense. Plus, we had two RICO charges. Now, none of those things were ever meant to be used for marijuana. Neither were conspiracy charges. You know, it was Bobby Kennedy who revived conspiracy in order to put Jimmy Hoffa away. Conspiracy charges are all hearsay testimony, and they were originally written during the Civil War so that you could prevent treason. You could arrest someone for conspiracy. Bobby Kennedy brought that back for Jimmy Hoffa, and now virtually every federal case has a conspiracy charge so that they're able to use hearsay. The DEA and FBI alleged we did up to three million pounds, maybe more. The truth is well under 100,000 pounds. There, there's a disparity there. The government gets their figures from the air. When the judge sentenced me to 64 years, I was already in my middle late 30s, and I said, Your Honor, I don't know if I can do that much time if I'll live that long. He said, well, just do what you can. Uh, you're not given any choice anywhere along the line. You always hold out hope that you're going to win an appeal. And I had appeals going virtually until the day I got out. And when I got out, I filed a suit. But I never won a thing. It keeps hope alive. I should have won, certainly. There were incredible irregularities in the conviction. In fact, the appellate court judges said they identified eight issues that would be proper for the Supreme Court to decide. But of course, the Supreme Court doesn't have to hear anything. Did they turn down your case? Oh, they, they never heard it. Despite the fact that the lower court recommended that they hear it. I'm a director of Normal in South Florida, National Organization Reform of Marijuana Law, and I've been traveling around the country doing book signings for Black Tuna Diary, talking. I was at Hempfest last year in Seattle. 2,000 people in front of me. 
and I'm talking and everybody's cheering and I looked out and I said, I'm wasting my time. I'm preaching to the choir. Sure they love it. And I just stopped dead and I told the whole audience, so I'm wasting my time talking to you people. Every one of you needs to go out and talk to somebody who's not in the movement. And then when I saw the exit polls in California and 65% of seniors had voted against, medical, against legalization, I knew something was wrong. My generation was Woodstock, smoke-ins. We were directly responsible for us having a volunteer army because we had the guts to do something about it. And all these people needed was a reason to vote for it. I found out that most seniors know nothing beyond that it's good for glaucoma. You know, it'll bring down your ocular pressure in a minute, just one joint. They know it's good for nausea, but they don't know that it's being used today to treat cancers, shrink tumors. It's being used to prevent and stave off Alzheimer's. You know, they used to tell us that marijuana destroyed your brain cells. Today they know that it is the greatest growth factor to produce brain cells and more important, the synapse that connect the cells. And that's why it's so effective in staving off dementia because that's what facilitates memory and the thought process. Cannabis removes about 10 times as much plaques than Aricept, which is a very expensive, dangerous drug that they use to treat Alzheimer's. So I decided to work for legalization. I'm very proud to say that I am directly responsible for the bill that was filed in Florida a few weeks ago. Last question. Uh, uh, to me, it's remarkable that you did 30 years and you seem, uh, how, how did you avoid becoming bitter? You, you don't seem like a bitter person. Don't forget I started out as an actor. <laughs> no, I was lucky. I came out, I had my wife. Now most people come out and have nobody. I had the ability to write. I write for High Times, I do a column for them, I write features, I wrote for the New York Times, I wrote infomercials, and I made a couple infomercials when I came out of prison and commercials. And I went back to being a pitchman while I finished the book because I could do that. Nobody had to pay me, pitchmen get paid for what they sell. I was selling frying pans in, in Sam's Clubs for almost a year until I taught myself how to use a computer. Because when I went away, there were none. Only the big ones in clean rooms with big rolls of tape. And then I finished the book and started going on a book tour. And High Times has really been fabulous to me. They've taken me everywhere. I've shared their table and, and I've written for them and been paid for it. And I just came from the Cannabis Cup in Denver. They screened the movie, it just, they wouldn't stop clapping and, and they loved it. And I was mobbed for three days. And uh, I'm a lucky guy. Why should I look back and be bitter? I can look forward and, and know that I'm 68, but I'm going to enjoy what time I can. Up in smoke. That's where my money goes 